So yeah, thank you again for inviting me. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about goat grass or some people call it crotch rocket. <laughs> lots and lots of uh, just nasty names for this weed. And I, this is probably one of the weeds that's on the top of my list of ones that I just am um, hating more and more every year. Um, you know, going back 20 years, I've been working with Cooperative Extension for 22 years now. And gosh, just going back the last 10, 15 years, you know, I was familiar with this weed. I would see it in little isolated populations, but it seems like, I don't know if you guys are experiencing the same, but here in the foothills, we are just seeing this thing spread at an alarming rate. So um, hopefully I've got a few slides to go through and I was trying to, to narrow it down so I wouldn't like dominate the whole time I have. So I'm hoping that um, I can fly through some of these so we can uh, have some time for some good questions and uh, discussion. So. Um, just a, a little bit about uh, goat grass. There's a couple of different species, but our goat grass uh, is definitely by far the most problematic, most widespread in the state. And um, this is a, a map uh, by Cal Flora. They do an excellent job with all of these distribution maps, and uh, it kind of shows the current um, state of this plant that we know of. It's probably even worse than this, but these are uh, some of the uh, the recorded observations that we currently have. So definitely in, in throughout the Sierra Nevada foothills where I'm at um, and in the central part of um, the Sacramento Valley and over into the, the, uh, the coast. So a little bit about um, this plant, again, non-native, um, introduced back in the early to mid 1900s. Uh, like I said, it's been rapidly spreading throughout uh, many of the areas that it's been observed in creates these horrible monocultures, mostly in annual rangelands, but also road lot, uh, roadsides. Um, and I'm seeing it more and more in chaparral uh, areas, um, poor grazing. So unfortunately, because it's you know unpalatable to livestock, we're basically selecting for it um, inadvertently because animals aren't eating it. So we're allowing it to set seed and that is just perpetuating or helping it um, uh, become more and more abundant. Um, it's nasty yawns can cause injury to animals and it does produce a very thick thatch uh, just because it's very slow to break down. So here's some pictures of uh, some that I've taken over the, the past several years. So here is it in its glory that you can see it just, you know, this is pretty much nothing but uh, goat grass and this is just what it has a tendency to do. Um, it, matures, I'll, I'll, it matures a little bit later than some of the desirable annuals. Uh, so you can see here it's intermixed with some wild oats and I think there's some uh, little rattlesnake grass in the in the very far back but these other desirables often you know mature and start browning out and then you see these green patches that um, often are either this plant um, or medusa head so this um, it has this red tinge often on top of the awns um, so that's usually a, a really good giveaway for identifying this plant um, you know, out in the distance, late in the season, often into, you know, uh, early July, sometimes even into August when it's still green. And here's just a, a close-up of the inflorescence or the, the flowering head. And, um, you can see why it gets the name goat grass. Uh, this kind of, you can kind of see the, the outline of what appears to be kind of like a, a goat's head um, as a part of the inflorescence here. So um, that's where it gets its, its common name, uh, goat grass. As I mentioned, uh, it is an annual, so this is a, a winter annual, uh, germinating with the first fall rain. So it's just now, um, it, we've been seeing germination for the last, I would say, couple of months, but just in the last few weeks, I've really started seeing it germinate here in the foothills. And um, it, what's really unique about this particular plant is you'll see here on this picture, when it matures, so um, when it sets seeds in the summertime, the entire inflorescence uh, breaks off at the top of the grass stem and then that whole inflorescence falls to the ground. So it's super easy to, you know, just kind of look down into the leaf litter um, uh, in, the, in the fall and you'll see these entire seed heads. And once uh, germination starts to grow, basically it's, you know, you, you'll see, and I have a picture next, you'll see just the, the, um, the new seedlings uh, germinating right out of, uh, out of this. And so it almost makes for like this little tuft grass uh, initially um, in, the, in the springtime as this plant's starting to grow. Uh, because it stays, um, I, I mentioned it stays green later into the season than some of the other desirables. And that's mostly because 
it does have a, a more robust, I would say, root system. It does put a lot more energy into root formation early on. And um, I'll show you a picture of just what I mentioned with that uh, early germination, what it looks like. And so this is what this was just a seed head that I picked up off the ground in one of my field trials yesterday. And you could see this um, all this germination happening right outside of the, the, the entire seed head. So we kind of get this little, these little tufts of, of goat grass. And I think that might play into part of its competitive advantage. It just it's a, it takes up more space um, right at the ground level earlier on. Um, and it's shading out and competing for those, uh, uh, those limited resources uh, with some of the other desirables. So, you know, I, when I think about why these particular plants are invading and why they're becoming so more prolific um, and rapidly spreading, you know, I, I mentioned that they are highly competitive, but, you know, in, when we look at California rangelands, you know, they're often very vast. And uh, we think about it's usually low grazing pressure, very large acreages. And so we're often, you know, selecting for this, this particular plant species because, you know, it's undesirable. Um, animals have the, the basically the, the choice of what they're going to eat out on the rangelands. And so they're going to go for those things that are more delicious, right? So they're going to, to basically selectively graze around this plant if they have the opportunity to do so. Um, and so, you know, these are the plants that we often allow to flower, set seed. And of course, it's, um, you know, basically just helping perpetuate and um, uh, increase populations of this uh, undesirable. And also what we're seeing here in the foothills is grazing timing. And so because these like Medusa head uh, mature later on in the season, um, many of our livestock producers are often pulling animals off, usually in May and early June to go to greener pastures, right? So they're moving animals off as the desirable grasses are starting to brown out. They're going to leave that all for fall feed or winter feed to come back to. And so they're taking the animals to the mountains uh, for grazing allotments. They're taking animals to irrigated pasture in the valley. And so again, we're pulling those animals off just as this plant is starting to flower. Um, so again, kind of selecting for, uh, for this particular plant. So some of the control strategies that we've been working on and others as well um, kind of fall around these themes of you know, it's an annual, so we want to prevent seed production. We want to work on defeating the seed bank. And luckily, it's not a very long seed bank. It's roughly two to three years is about how long the, there's two different seeds in barb go grass. And so one um, germinates typically the year after it's formed, and the other one um, has a little bit more dormancy period to it. So it often uh, doesn't germinate till the second or third year, but still super short um, lived seed bank. So it's definitely doable. Um, but then we also want to do, you know, basically the same thing that we talk about all the time in terms of monitoring, looking for those satellite populations and minimizing spread. And when I work with ranchers, this is a, a, a ranch that, um, you know, has barbed goat grass and, you know, they were completely unaware of how it was spreading across the ranch and it wasn't until we started looking more closely at, you know, their equipment, um, it was very apparent that, you know, just driving the quad in and around uh, through the pastures in late summer, um, you know, this unfortunately is just, you know, you can see how those whole inflorescences, those flowering clusters, they just snap right off at the top of the, the plant. And so, you know, here we are just moving around uh, all of these seeds uh, across the, the ranch. So trying to minimize, um, you know, any sort of animal movement or vehicle uh, um, or equipment movement uh, during this time of year is really critical. So a couple of control strategies I thought I'd just mention. Um, this was a, a burning exercise that I um, was a part of this just this last uh, summer with Cal Fire um, and a, a local property owner basically looking at trying to again get control of some of these late season uh, winter um, weeds. And so we had yellow star thistle in here, we had Medusa head and we had goat grass. And so uh, we know burning is super, super effective. Um, and it's, um, you know, timing is basically we want to do it right before these things are starting to flower and make seed and use all of those desirable annuals that mature early as the fuel source. And so, um, you know, the, the, the timing is typically late April and into early June, depending on 
you know, where you're at in the state and the growing conditions and all of that. But um, it, uh, it can be a little bit tricky to, to pull off these fires uh, effectively, uh, just because it takes a lot of coordination often with uh, uh, local fire personnel um, and, um, you know, air quality resources, control board, all of those kinds of things need to kind of line up. Um, so we often see sometimes these things um, not always happen, but super effective for, uh, for preventing seed production when you can pull them off. The other one that I've been kind of really interested in, haven't had a chance to, um, to really effectively uh, test from a research perspective is the idea of rather than doing a, a burn in the late spring, early summer before uh, seed set, but is to think about maybe using burning as a tool during the winter months to effectively kill newly germinated seedlings. And so this is what, I, is what I'm calling a, a late fall or early winter burn. And I've been a part of a, a couple of um, uh, trials where we've looked at this idea of doing a, a winter burn. And the, the concept is, you know, finding areas where there is tons and tons of thatch. So either lots of goat grass intermixed with maybe Medusa head thatch. So, you know, three or four inches of, of thatch on the ground, um, waiting for some, but the majority of the germination to have happened. So maybe it's late November, early December, maybe even into January. Um, and then waiting for a dry period during that winter month where the thatch uh, has the, you know, dries out for a few days and you can light that thatch and basically carry a, a very low intensity fire through that thatch, uh, killing all those newly germinated seedlings. And so um, we've done it a couple of different times. It's been super effective. Um, just need to, to, to further study and actually uh, put in some research trials where we uh, maybe look at reseeding and what the percent control is. But um, maybe it's something that might uh, be potentially more doable just because it's a little bit lower risk of, uh, of wildfire. So these are just some considerations to think of uh, if you're going to do burning, um, you know, leaves lots of bare ground, lots of nutrients are released on the site. So, you know, um, reseeding is often required depending on what the site conditions are. And then also we've learned that uh, goat grass is released after a burn. So, you know, coming in the year after the burn and doing some other control strategy is uh, super, super critical. Um, there's been lots of work looking at mowing. So um, many different places have had success stories with mowing as a control strategy. Again, timing is basically sort of that same idea. You want to do it during that uh, bolting uh, or boot stage of the, of the grass, just as those ons are starting to come up out of the grass. Uh, so you want to prevent flower production. So um, again, uh, it's kind of that getting into that later time of the, the spring and early summer when all those desirables have browned out. Um, so again, chances for uh, fires start to again become a risk. And so you have to know your site um, and use the appropriate equipment. And this again, this is probably more for smaller infestations where you can actually get in there um, with uh, some type of a, a mower. So this is what the conditions will often look like for mowing. Um, you can see all the desirables have set seed, they're browning out. Um, and then you see these little pockets of green, which uh, in this particular uh, picture, this is Medusa head, um, but it would be the very similar situation for, uh, for goat grass. It'd be, you know, just starting to, those ons would just be starting to come up out of the leaf sheath and it's just starting to flower. And that's when you would wanna to hit it with a mower. And the same goes true for grazing. So, you know, whether you're mowing or grazing, the idea, the concept is exactly the same, right? We're just chopping it down, whether you're using animals or uh, some type of equipment. Um, and so the timing would be exactly the same uh, as uh, the mowing that I just described. But the problem is often we just don't have the intensity of animals. We don't have small enough pastures to be able to, you know, intensively graze that area to hit it hard enough in a short enough period of time. Um, to prevent it from flowering and making seeds. So, um, you know, I've been working with some ranchers on putting up um, uh, electric fencing to, uh, to get that higher intensity grazing. Um, and it's been super effective. It's just, you know, again, you have to have the number of animals, you have to be able to have the equipment, um, you know, offsite water and, and the fencing to be able to, to concentrate those animals. But it is super effective if you can do it. 
a couple of chemicals that we've been looking at and testing. Um, this is a little bit tricky because we're trying to essentially get a grass out of a, a grass dominant ecosystem. And so um, one of the ones that I've been looking at and working with some ranchers, this is the background picture here is a, of a ranch that was 100, almost 100% goat grass. I mean, there's some desirables in here, but over the years it has become predominantly uh, goat grass. And so um, we worked with the RCD in El Dorado County um, uh, to apply um, low, uh, low concentrations of, of glyphosate uh, late season. So, you know, glyphosate or Roundup is a non-selective herbicide, but using it late in the season after all the desirable grasses that were present had uh, flowered and set seed, we then went in and made um, an application of of glyphosate, um, just as the goat grass was again starting to early flower, and so you can see in the background here, you can see these little patches of green. You can; these are obviously um, the areas that the uh, rancher missed, right? So these are the spray strips that um, you can see, obviously where they uh, missed. But all of the brown is uh, dead goat grass. Um, so it was super effective. They've done it a couple of years in a row now. Um, and this pasture is starting to, uh, to, to go back to more desirables, um, even without reseeding, but um, there's still some goat grass that still needs to be uh, 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 focused on in that, that ranch. Uh, another herbicide that has been tested, this is aminocyclopyrochlor, and this is a, a broadleaf, technically thought of as a broadleaf herbicide. It's one of the oxen herbicides. Uh, but it does have some um, efficacy on grasses, including uh, goat grass. And so my colleague, uh, Guy Kaiser, did some research um, looking at aminocyclopyrochlor and timing and found that um, uh, at pretty low, pretty low rates, four ounces gave uh, pretty good uh, results on goat grass. And the, it basically came down to timing of when you apply that herbicide. Um, he, he did four ounces as a, a single treatment, a single herbicide application, both in the fall, sort of the middle of winter, like January, February, and then also in the spring. And that provided pretty darn good control. But what he found out that is if he split that herbicide up into two applications, still applying four ounces, but two ounces and two ounces, uh, one in the fall and one in the middle of winter, that actually gave the best control. Um, I think it was up to uh, 90 some odd percent control of goat grass with that split application. Um, the problem is we don't have aminocyclopyrochlor currently registered um, on rangelands. There's, um, it is registered here in California, but there is grazing restrictions for aminocyclopyrochlor currently. So, um, so it's really not a, a, a tool in the toolbox. Um, one last project I want to just, um, I'll wrap this up with this slide here is or I've got one more slide is, um, this is a project that I'm working on with the Amador um, RCD. We got a grant to examine um, the effects of adding compost to annual rangeland. You guys have probably been hearing about all of this hype about um, compost and uh, increasing carbon sequestration on rangeland. Um, so I wanted to, to look at this as, you know, what's the potential long-term impacts of, of adding compost to annual rangelands from a weed perspective. And so, this is a project I just put in a year ago, so we're just starting to get really the, the, the first round of data um, uh, looking at some of the different potential effects. And I wanted to, because this is a weed related talk, I wanted to point out what we're seeing specifically as it relates to weeds. And so um, I know there's tons and tons of um, information on this slide, but I want to point out what, what, what's going on here. And so in this study, I'm looking at um, you know, what's happening, you know, without any compost. So that's the control. So just status quo rangeland. Um, I'm also looking at what dusting just with compost alone does. Um, I'm also looking at what it happens if we just throw out some desirable um, clover seed. And I'm also looking at what happens when we use both compost and clover seed together. And so that's the different treatments represented here with these different colors from gray bean control, blue bean compost, yellow seed, and orange, the compost plus seed. And so this was the first year of data from this last uh, spring where I looked at basically um, percent plant cover. So what's happening out there in terms of biodiversity of different plants and how much space are they taking up 
on the rangelands from all these different species. But the weeds are over here on the far right. So you can see all these tall bars. These are predominantly very weedy pastures um, consisting of barbed goat grass, foxtail, medusa head, yellow star thistle. And so if we just look at barbed goat grass here, so that's these four bars here, the gray, blue, uh, yellow, and orange. So with the control, um, you know, we've got lots and lots of barbed goat grass out there. But once we start doing some of these different techniques, when we add compost alone, we see a slight decrease in uh, barbed goat grass just after the first year. Um, if we look at just adding desirable clover seed, we see even a bigger decrease in barbed goat grass. And when we do both compost and clover seed, we see a much larger decrease in um, uh, uh, barbed goat grass. So just by adding the compost, we're potentially maybe shifting the competitive advantage to maybe some more desirables. Um, again, this is just one year's worth of data. I'm going to be collecting the second year's worth here in the next couple of months, but um, just wanted to, to share one of the other projects that I'm currently looking at, just um, kind of thinking maybe a little bit larger globally um, of how maybe we might shift the, uh, the dynamics of um, of some of these, uh, some of these ecosystems. So um, I apologize, I, I took up a lot of that time with the, the slides, but hopefully it leaves a couple of questions or a couple of minutes for any questions uh, to the group or any thoughts on anything that I may have missed or any experiences you all might have. Thank you, Scott. I have to say that the compost and seeds is really cool. I hope that you keep researching that because I know a few people I think who would like to try that down here. Does anyone have any goat grass questions? I just wanted to make a comment. I, I was also encouraged to see that, that that compost and seed treatment was effective on Medusa head. So I'll be uh, really anxious to see all your results. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, we're super excited. I mean, um, you know, we often see both of those species seem like they do well on poor sites. Um, and I, going back into the literature, back even from the early like 50s and 60s, there was lots of work being done um, by many different um, groups looking at how to increase fertility, uh, mostly through, in that case, it was mostly through um, uh, synthetic fertilizers. But um, yeah, we're excited to see what happened this last year. And I, I'll be curious to see if that trend continues this current year. I had a question, Scott. When you showed the Calflora distribution, I might have misunderstood, but did you say that there was some missing that you knew about? Oh, um, maybe not necessarily missing. Um, I just don't know how thorough, I mean, how big of a picture that paints. I, for how fast I've been seeing it move around, um, I don't know if all of those accounts are currently captured. Um, it probably is pretty darn good, but I, it just, I, I, I don't, I don't know how, um, I think it's, it's getting very extensive in terms of its population spread. So I don't know, um, if there's any missing data or not, I guess that would be a, a, a sideline conversation we could yeah. have. Yeah, that sounds good. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, there's always missing data, <laughs> especially on plants. <laughs> Does anyone else have any questions for Scott? That was great. Nice to see pictures of the foothills, even though there was goat grass in them. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks again for having me, Donna. <laughs> well, thank everybody. you so much. So um, next up is Cynthia Powell. She is the executive director of CalFlora, which is a, um, a resource that we all use. And it looks like John is here too. I don't know if you guys are gonna be tag teaming, um, but- I don't uh, think so. Okay. <laughs> but if, if there's questions people can't, that I can't answer, he can probably he can answer, answer them. Okay, cool. Yeah. So again, this is being recorded and Cynthia, you have till about 1130-ish. Okay, great. So take it away. Okay, so let me share my screen here. Share screen. It's not there yet. Uh, two. Now you see some blue. Yep. There we go. Now is that excellent. Yep. Okay. That's great. 
And since this is a pretty small group, if you guys have questions as I go, um, just just ask. You know, we don't have to wait till the end of the presentation. So I wanted to talk about Calflora basics. Have any of you on the call not used Calflora before? And then I'll go more basic if that's the case. Okay, um, how to search different, um, search and use different search functions, adding observations to the Calflora website uh, versus the app. And maybe since Scott's here and he might know of some goat grass that's not yet in Calflora, we could do a live demo of how one might add goat grass observations to Calflora. Um, if, if you're comfortable, Scott, later we could do that. Data sources um, included in Calflora, so the integration of iNaturalist data, options to protect uh, sensitive species and sensitive sites. That's not such a big topic for this group, but I thought I'd throw it in there. And then verification process for confirming weed species. How does that happen? We serve data um, on all 10,000 native and introduced species in the entire state. And that is a total of over 3 million location observations. Until about 2010, that was just points. But now as of 2010, you can also add a line in a polygon. So later with Scott, as we're adding goat grass into Calflora, it would probably make sense since like he said, it's spreading so quickly. If we added a bunch of, or you know, maybe one as a demo and he could do more later polygons showing, showing the extent, because um, that's, valuable, even though it's an invasive moving quickly, uh, tracking that movement is really important. 30,000 relations to old and new plant names. I don't think this is relevant for goat grass, but a lot of species do change names over time as we learn more about them. So whether you're searching for an old name or a new name or a super, super old name, it crosswalks together to one uh, taxon report page. And that taxon report page or plant profile is what Scott showed with the goat grass distribution. I'll go more into those in a minute. 300,000 plant photos. And um, not to harp on Scott, but those photos you had <laughs> were incredible. And I'm really hoping to get some of those into Calflora also, so we can talk about that offline. The plant photos we have come from Calflora. They come from Calphotos, which is a separate entity from Calflora. They're part of the UC. They generously share their photos with us. Um, if you make an observation at an iNaturalist that includes a photo and that observation gets pulled into Calflora, one photo does come with it, but we don't use it as a reference photo. Uh, we have about 88,000 visitors each month to the Calflora website, and it varies seasonally, and that number, of course, has skyrocketed since the COVID, and about 4,000 active data contributors. Most of you are probably on that list, and if you're not, uh, you should be after this presentation. So as I said, we are serving data that's not just our own, but coming from other sources as well, hence Clearinghouse. Um, we, you can download observations from Calflora in any file format. Go ahead and try and throw one out there that we don't include. So JSON, GeoJSON, Shapefile, KML, CSV, Excel. Um, so anything that you're looking for that you want to export and put into your own system, you can do that. And our data sources include Calflora, so-called native native observations, although they might not be of native plants, EDD maps, specimens from CCH, and we are hopefully going to be able to serve CCH2 data soon as well. That's more up-to-date and current than CCH1, and iNaturalist. Here's another um, taxon report map for um, showing stinkwort, Ditricus graviolans, and a couple photos by Ron Vanderhoff as reference photos. And this is the bread and butter, the kind of basics of what Calflora serves. And as you, as data contributors, add your observations to Calflora, these maps improve with their accuracy and with the representation of where the plants are distributed today, right, the second. You'll notice for some of the invasive plant distribution maps, these red squares, and those come from Calypsi. We've partnered with uh, the California Invasive Plant Council to get data out 
of, they have a, a mapping application called CalWeed Mapper and put it into CalFlora. And then also CalFlora feeds CalWeed Mapper. So anything you put into CalFlora will also show up in, in their system. And when you see outliers, I always, whenever I see these maps, I look for the outliers and I like to see what's going on with those. And for invasives, unfortunately, usually they're accurate. Um, there's, I see a couple outliers there. We could drill down and see what exact, who saw that? What do they know? Were they right? And do their photos match the species, et cetera? So what should you do if you see stinkwort in Humboldt or Kern counties? Should you A, look away quickly? I didn't see it, it's not there. If I didn't see it, it's not there. B, report it to CalFlora. C, pull it out before it produces seeds. You guys, is there a chat? Can people write in the chat whenever they? There is a chat. It's open okay. to everybody. And okay. I would say all three. <laughs> <laughs> look away while you pull it out. Don't look, look at it. Look away as you're and then it. come back and pull it. <laughs> okay, let's see if Tanya's right. Well, I think if if you're if you're skilled enough to be able to look away while you're pulling, then you that could be true. It could be all three. Um, report to CalFlora and pull it out before it produces seeds. The main thing, um, and Gina got Gina got it right with the traditional way of thinking about the question. <laughs> <laughs> B and C in the chat. How should you go about B? So that's mostly what I want to talk about today. People say like, well, okay, so Scott knows about some goat grass that's not in CalFlora. How do we let you know? Do you, want, do you want to know about it? And how do we let you know? Yes, whatever it is, if it's a wild plant in the state of California, I do want to know about it. The database does want to know about it. And how do we go about it? And there are dozens of ways. So there's not just one right way. There might be one way that works better for you or a few ways that work better for you and your workflow and the way that you um, exist in the world. And here are just a few. We have a phone app called Observer Pro and you don't need connectivity or a network or Wi-Fi or anything like that when you're in the field. So even if you're on a long backpacking trip, you can be in airplane mode, save your battery, and um, use Observer Pro out in the field to document what you're seeing. It's a free app on Android and iPhone. You can, and this is what I'm thinking Scott and I might do after this call, is if he has a spreadsheet um, with lat longs for the goat grass, this would be points. You can also um, upload shape files if you have polygons, but as long as you have an observer, a date, a location, and ideally a species name, if you don't know which species you're looking at, you can still add it to CalFlora as unknown and put it in this group we call um, Plant ID Help Group. And if you want to add a location description, as you can see on this Excel, um, these people have added a location description, you can, but that's extra. You really need observer, date, location, and then either the species or just the genus if you don't know the species and unknown plant ID help group if you don't know. Some people really like to use a handheld GPS to get points, to collect points in the field and add it to CalFlora at a computer. Um, you know, if that's your thing, that works too. If you prefer to just use your phone to take photos and not use the app, just have them go into your gallery, you can pull the geotagged photos. Geotag means it has a, a location embedded in it. Add those photos to CalFlora. CalPhotos, you can just add photos to without a location, but one of the beautiful um, and amazing, it actually adds a lot of sophistication and depth to the CalFlora database is that you can't add a photo without a location. Um, and that location, so everything you add to the database, we use that location to inform all of all the applications within CalFlora. So for instance, this isn't relevant for invasive plants, but if you wanna know what to plant at a restoration site, well, it is, you pull out a bunch of invasives, you have a restoration site, you wanna know what would grow well there, you can use the planting guide and all the soil precipitation, um, elevation information from every single observation in the database goes into the planting guide algorithm to be able to spit out what list of plants, native plants obviously, would grow well at this location um, that you're wondering about. Could also be a backyard, garden, anything like that. So geotagged photos, easy to add to CalFlora also. You can add 
one observation at a time, and this is what we'll do live um, with Scott in a, once we're on the website in a little while. And you choose a group, which if you're not a member of any CalFlora groups yet, you can just be independent like I am in this screenshot. And you can use, we have lots of different projects to choose from, and each project has a different data collection form. So for instance, for invasive plants, in your, if you're collecting polygons, you might want to know percent cover, cover and number of plants. Um, so different questions are asked depending on which project you, you're using and which data collection form. And then access by others, I'm going to get into in a minute. That includes obscuring if it's a rare plant or if it's an invasive plant on private property and you don't really have permission to release exactly where it is, but you want people to know that it's it's nearby within a few miles, you could obscure invasive observations too. You can upload shapefiles or geodatabases to CalFlora. That's a great way to get polygons in. And then here is the structure of CalFlora data in, data out. So you put data in and um, other people get data out. So professional botanists, amateur botanists, other observers, institutions, WMA members, for instance, Yolo County, RCD, for instance, put data into CalFlora. And then everybody who's working within Yolo County um, or outside, you know, and looking into y Yolo County can get that information. Just touch briefly on what Weed Manager is. You might have heard about it. Some of you might actually be using Weed Manager. It's a system enabling organizations engaged in land management to track weed infestations and treatments over time. And that is a suite of tools, as Doug Johnson likes to call it, that is a subscription. Um, it's about 3,000 or I think it's 3,100 a year now for up to 10 users. Um, and if you use Weed Manager, you can collect exact treatment information if you're using chemicals. And there are some WMAs and using it. And I think there's one RCD using Weed Manager now too. It's a great way to create reports and say, we did all this work. We pulled all this, all these species and um, how we've been spending our time and money. And if you need a point with a radius, if, you, if your agency requires polygons, if you need percent cover and plant count, then um, you can use Weed Manager to get all your customized data collection forms di dialed in so that your group gets what they need out of the system. So you collect data, use personalized forms, data dictionaries, searchable, viewable online, run customized reports, and export to many formats. And that's all also true for general CalFlora. That's not Weed Manager. It's just not with treatment information available. OK, now for data accuracy. If you see an incorrect location or ID in CalFlora, what should you do? A, keep your frustration to yourself. B, comment on the record so the observer will receive an email. C, let CalFlora know. I'm watching the chat to see what you guys write in here. Gina says C. Tanya says B and C. Amy says C. Scott says C. OK, C is good. And commenting on the record is a way to let CalFlora know. So it's, it's kind of not, it's also is a little bit of a trick question. If you comment on the record, the observer receives an email and also will, will we know we see those comments too. So B and C, keeping your frustration to yourself is, um, you know, it's not a psychology talk, so I won't go into that. <laughs> there we go, B and C. So David Cratville said, this hydrilla cannot grow here. This is an aquatic plant. This is nowhere near anything water. And he, commented on the record and then we saw that and we knew we had to do something about it. So that's um, one way uh, to let people know and to let CalFlora know. So adding observations on the CalFlora website versus the app and data sources including CalFlora, the integration of iNaturalist data. 
To add observations from the homepage, there's a link called Add Observations. There are a lot of options, as we just talked about, and five of them that are highlighted when you say Add Observations are Add Records for My Naturalist. So if you use iNaturalist, you can pull your records in there. Survey or checklist entry, that's a way to say in all of Yolo County, well, actually that's not very useful. In let's say a quad or a, or a quarter quad in Yolo County, we saw uh, 16 species. And actually I have a plant list for your um, WMA uh, priority weeds. So that would be where have, you know, you could use that list and say, where have we seen these species and we've seen them in a certain area. That's a survey. Plant observation entry was a screenshot I showed you earlier. We can add one observation at a time. It can be also polygon. Multiple photo upload. If you just like to take geotagged photos with your phone and get them in the database, that's how you can do that. And then Observer Pro phone apps in the field. Groups, I'm actually not going to get into groups. That is too much. You can create private groups also if you have a lot of uh, private property you're working on. So let's go to look at the iNaturalist, including iNaturalist data in. We do have a Yolo County WMA group that everyone should join. OK, great. Let's look at that. Uh, can you see Chrome now with the CalFlora homepage on it? Yes, okay, great. Let's, if you wanna join the Yolo County WMA group um, and then you guys can share the, uh, your target weeds list, illustrated plant list with that group. From the calflora.org homepage, make sure you're signed in. Um, and if you don't, if you haven't already registered with CalFlora, you just go ahead and, and register and create a password. And then go to My Calflora. That's everything customized to you. And it is super easy to register. So this has my observations, my contributor profile, my groups, my comments, comments I've made, or I can also look at all comments, my preferences, my searches, my email alerts, my plant lists, and my shapes. And if you go to groups and you want to join the Yellow County WMA group, I wonder if I'm already a part of this. Why? So here I are my groups. I think you are actually. Okay. Yeah. My groups, and then if you want to, if you're not yet a member, you can um, do this. Join another group to find it. Let's see if it's listed here. I'm in a lot of groups. Yellow County WMA. There we go. 13 members here. If your name's on here, you're already in the group. Gina's in there. Amy's in there. And if you're not in there, like I said, go to join another group and you'll see it there. That is an open group, not a private group. And Gina did this just now. Now let's go to, um, before we get to the iNut thing, I just wanna show you the plant list that I created for your group. Uh, did you see what I just did? From the CalFlora homepage, my CalFlora, and then plant lists. And don't be overwhelmed. I do have a lot of lists. You, you, you might not, pro you probably won't have quite that many. Um, here's the WMA Yellow County target weeds. Tanya sent me this list. And let's look at an illustrated plant list for it. Oh, it's a 16. Okay. I thought I said 19. Here they are. Oh, oh, Gina. Oh, Gina did some work on her alligator weed observations and I think moved some photos around. So I think the connection, let's just check what's going on with that. Because we were using one of her photos as a reference photo and now it's gone. So I'm just going to delete that first one and we'll figure out what went on with that connection later. Delete. Okay. Refresh. So now here we have... Um, this list, oh no, there's another one. <laughs> there's another one, okay, hold on. Gina, you're doing great work with um, your photos and I know that you're putting your, um, your stacking, she's creating history stacks to show change over time, which is really good. Um, and then since I'd already, she had some incredible photos we'd already used as reference photos here, when she changes around her photos, then um, I have to reassociate them, but that's okay, we'll get that worked out. You can include all species and subspecies, show bloom period. 
order by bloom start month, group by family, have no photos. If you just want to have a list that you copy and paste out, you might not want the photos and show photo links display. Okay. So here, here's your list and you can add to it, edit it, change it at any time. And the way you get again to plant lists is you go to Calflora, my Calflora plant list, and I'm just going to make this list available to this group. So nice that starts with a Y. It's so easy to find. All right, so now this list is available to everybody. And even if it weren't available to you um, because you're not part of the group, you can share this URL and all URLs link things in Calflora that I'm highlighting here at the top and paste them into emails or into chats, IMs, and that person will see exactly what you're seeing. Okay, so now I naturalist, I keep getting distracted. From the homepage, go to add observations and go to add records for my naturalist. Does anybody have an iNaturalist handle they could paste or cop right into the chat so we can look your stuff up or we can just look at a specific species in Yolo County? While you're typing your uh, handle into the chat, I'm gonna show you layers. There's a lot of different layers available on all maps in Calflora. And right now I have county lines turned on, which is great. Um, we could have streams, we could look at protected areas, which are, when, when you turn that on, then these um, protected areas turn pastel. And if you click on them, El Dorado National Forest, it says which one it is that you just clicked on. So, oh, good answer. Gina says, I am strictly a Calflora user. <laughs> I like it. Maybe nobody uses INAT. So let's look up a species. What species um, should we look up where there might be some observations that aren't already in Calflora? How about purple star thistle? Okay. So you can, if you're, the spelling is unsure, just start typing it into the common name. You said purple what? Star thistle. Star thistle. Purple star thistle. Yeah, I get the A's and the U's and the E's and the A's mixed up in that. So let's see what we've got. And there might not be any that haven't been pulled into Calflora already, and there, but I bet there will be some. Oh yeah, there's a lot. I, and the reason why these are not yet in Calflora could be because um, they're really fresh and we haven't, we do a monthly data pull from my naturalist. So it could be that they just happened and we haven't pulled them in yet. It could be that um, we have a density filter. So especially for invasive plants, we just don't want tons of them where we, if we already know that it's there, we don't need to have like one, one inch away, one inch away from the next one. So they're kind of on top of each other. It's not, so that could be why it's not in there. It could also be that it's outside. It's um, where we think it could grow, which for invasives, the algorithm is a little bit different because as you know, they can pretty much grow anywhere. Best. So are we still on iNaturalist? Because it doesn't look like anybody here uses it. Yeah, well, if so, Yuta and Doug at Calypsi don't use iNaturalist, but they've been pulling iNaturalist records into Calflora because if you're looking at the distribution of a species like alligator weed and you say, huh, that's not complete. You know, there's something mm -hmm. wrong. There's like more than that that I, I think should be in there. Um, then you can look at iNaturalist and see what exactly you want to pull in. So, but yeah, maybe nobody used iNaturalist and this isn't that useful. So I could just stop there. I'll say, if you did want to pull in this purple star thistle, if you think it does exist, Daniel George. Oh yeah, he's a, he's a reliable source. I actually, if it's the same Daniel George, I know him. He's a good botanist. So I'm going to go ahead and pull in this one. So add to Calflora. So now that's also in Calflora. Um, do you want to live add some observations to Calflora, um, kind of since it's a small group sure. doing that? Okay, and Brenda says to be careful with the QAQC on INAT data since it has many miss IDs, which is true, which is why we carefully filter what we pull in without looking at it one by one. That's um, why we're all strictly Calflora users. Yeah. <laughs> You guys are so good. You know exactly what to say. 
So add observations. Do you want? Should we just do it using plant observation entry? The one online. Sure. Okay. Yes. This one. So new record. I'll go into. Let's see. I'll put it in this group. Use advanced. Um, what species do you want? Do what species? Well, actually, you know? yeah. I made myself. Um, one of the things I wanted to do, there's a weird little population of goat grass on the north edge of the city of Davis. I thought I should map that. Yeah. <laughs> okay, you should. And you can do it now with me. You, we could also, if you want to share your screen, you could do it that way. Do you think you'd learn better sharing your screen? Um, I think you should stay in control, not me. <laughs> okay, so you said it was goat. What did you say it was, goat grass? It's goat grass, yeah. Okay. So we'll just write, I'm not even going to try and spell it. I'll do this. Goat grass. It's this one, right? Jointed. Is that right? It's, well, Scott is talking about be, barbed. Uh, triencialis, Agalops triencialis. Did you say you, it was, um, you had barbed, did you find on Davis or was it? I'm going to guess that it was. I didn't get that far. I just started hand pulling it. Uh, very bottom, Cynthia, the very last. This one? Yeah. Okay. And it's Tanya M E Y E R. Mm hmm. Because I definitely didn't see it. So that's important to get her name in here. And I'll actually transfer ownership of this observation over to her once we're done. When did you see it? I saw it three springs ago. So May 2018. I'll just say 01. 01 kind of means you might have seen it on the 1st of May, but most likely it was sometime in May and you don't know exactly the date, which is fine. Exactly it. And then let's set the point location. So you said north of north, Davis? North, yeah. So zoom. Northwest? Uh, do, do north. Do north, okay. Right at the very top of the town. It's another reason why I picked it because I thought it'd be easy to get to. Yeah. Am keep I going north? Keep going north, okay. Okay. And then go a little bit to the west. Okay, see that, go back to this move. Okay, see the corner of this, I'm pointing to it, which is no help. <laughs> see that line, that blue line that curves, that makes a right angle? This nope. one? Nope, go down back here. to town, back to this town, one. right there, right there. Uh -huh. That's where so it is, like on the corner. On, the, on that corner of the river? It's a storm drain. Storm drain, okay. And is it on the north or the south side? It's on the north side, northwest corner. Okay, so like right there? More or less, yeah. Okay. And once You I could turn on the satellite, that, oh, yeah. that would help. Oh, good idea. Oh yeah, okay. That's exactly where it is. Okay. And if Tanya decides to change it later, when she owns it, she'll be able to edit it. Everybody else going in to look at this, Observation won't be able to edit it. Do you want to say anything? I could say near storm drain. This is all icing, these location description. If you want to create a pot, was it just one or was it more? Oh no, it was sort of a, it was along the strip and then into that patch there. So like here? There and then across the path. Oh, over here too. Wow. A little bit, but just along the edge of the path. Okay, for demonstration purposes, that's great because I could draw a polygon. So I'm going to go, I already did the point location, which is fine. I'm also going to add a polygon to it, um, which for invasives is really efficient way to say it wasn't just in this one place. It was all over here. Like that, Tanya? No, it was no. just a strip because it's actually kind of a steep okay. bank. So it's just literally right along the edge of the path. I see. So I got a little over exuberant there. Mm -hmm, you did. <laughs> <laughs> so like that more? Yeah. And and this far down? Or move this Yeah, back no, up? that's good, that's good. That was good down there, okay. Yeah. All right, stop drawing. And if you wanted to fill in these other fields, you could. You could also say this Calypse, um, all observations have a management status field and was it are you doing anything with it Tanya? yeah we're hand pulling it and amy and i weed whacked it last year wow okay yeah. so it's officially under management and if you don't use weed manager you can still use this management status field 
to say that it's under management. You can't say exactly what it is that you're doing. I mean, you could write it in the notes. It's not that useful, but um, if you're using chemicals, you don't want to write anything about chemicals in the notes because it's a, a politically sensitive issue and that's a publicly viewable field. But um, if you have, for instance, let's just do a new record, same plant. If you have, um, I'm going to show you guys what, what weed manager fields look like, observer protesters, weed observations, okay. So this is the treatment section that's only available to weed manager and it's kept under lock and key so nobody else can see this. So you can say hand pull, herbicide, grazing, propane, flaming, controlled burn, power tools, whatever you did, herbicide, solution amount, solution units, which product, all this and then save it. Um, and you can still have a management status. This is publicly viewable, but the rest of this treatment information is not. I'll cancel over that one. Okay, so that's Tanya's record. And now when we go um, to search for goat grass or any species near Davis by Tanya or by anybody else, let's just do that. So here we are. I went from the homepage to observation search, which is searching all observations. And it brings me to the Bay Area because that's where I have my center point under my preferences. But depending on where you live, you change your center point. So let's just look in Davis or around Davis for any Calypsi listed species. Oh, we could even do better than that. More criteria. We can use our plant list. Yeah, here we go. YOLO WMA County target weeds from 2020. So that's that list we were just looking at. We don't need that anymore, although I'm sure it's the same. For this area, so in map area, we could also draw a polygon if you wanted to be more specific. We could open up layers um, and search and just see what's here. Oh, oh, it's going to be a lot. Oh, no, it's not too bad. So I'm going to fold up the map, 23 results. There's our, there's Tanya's goat grass that she just, or we just added together. Tanya has some iris in here also from 2010. And some other records. And if you wanted to revisit those records, let's see, how much more time do I have, Tanya? I lost track. Mm, you have till 1130. Oh, good. So we do have time for this. If you wanted to revisit <laughs> any, <laughs> I can get carried away and then, uh -huh. <laughs> then you just never know. Say you wanted to go back and let's look at, um, oh, that's the one we just did. Yeah, well, here we are in 2021, right? So Tanya saw that in 2018. Have you seen it since then? I did go back last spring and there was a few little sprigs. Okay, so here's how you can create a history stack, which Gina Darren is a current expert at. And also how you could use Observer Pro to travel in the field to these locations. If you wanted to find these 23 target weeds for your WMA that are within the map area, or we could even back it out and do more. Using Observer Pro, you can load these. Yeah, that's that's better. So anywhere, anytime you're in this region, you want to be searching for what's already in Calflora as published, either um, could you add iNaturalist too. You can add iNaturalist. I don't usually add CCH when I want to go out in the field and find it with Observer Pro again because the location accuracy, you know, the records from CCH are a little bit older. And so they didn't have the georeferencing capabilities that we have now. So it's disappointing whenever I try and f find a CCH record in the field again because it's not exactly where the point is in the record. Um, so let's include iNaturalist. And then 368 records that are on your target weed list. And here they are. Oh, here's a Tree of Heaven by Tanya. Is this Tanya Meyer? Mm -hmm. Yep, Tanya Meyer, good. Go to Tools and then save the search. Let's call it YOLO WMA Target Weeds Near Davis and save it. Now I could set up an email alert so that anytime a species on your target weed list 
is found in what I have in my search query right now, which is the map area, I'll receive an email saying so-and-so found the species and then you can click through to find more information on it and load historical records onto or into Observer Pro. So if you're gonna be using, it looks like Tanya already uses the iPhone app and I only know that because I see this IO at the beginning of her ID on this record. Mm -hmm. um, you can put all these in there and then go out and refine them and create history stacks that way. So you would load it into Observer Pro and then for simple data collection, when I'm using that project available from independent, here we go. YOLO WMA target weeds near Davis. And for this one, I'm just gonna say none. Save preferences. And um, I'm not gonna do this right now because it would take too long, but I could screen share Observer Pro from my phone and show you guys that you see now those on the map in Observer Pro and you can go revisit them. There was another option, which was to create an alert. And I think that would be a good alert for everybody in this uh, group to set up. So I'm gonna make this search. Well, maybe I should actually make the search in a bigger area, like in the whole county and not just near yes, Davis. Yes, whole county, that's be okay. our weed management area. So let's go back to here we are at the homepage. Go to observation search again. Well, I could go to my available search. We're, I'll just start from fresh. I could also go to the search that we already did and redo it, but I'll go here, add the plant list. And let's see. So should we do all of Yolo County? Yes, please. And anywhere else or just all of Yolo County? That's, a, that's enough. That's sufficient because that's exactly where your WMA is. Okay. So here are 236. Do you guys want to have CCH or INAT also included in your email alert? Um, <sighs> that way, if, if somebody adds it from INAT, you'll know. I think the it. consortium data would be helpful be, just because that's the highest quality data we could have when you have a voucher specimen in an herbaria. Right. Yeah. And that, you know, your comment earlier, I just wonder if there's some way, I know from my own, some of my own specimens that are in the herbarium at, Dave, mm -hmm. at UC Davis, I've looked online and they're shown to be like, they're from a wetland and they're shown on the top of a hill somewhere. And I knew the coordinates were provided correctly. Um, I just wonder if there's some way through a grant or something else that um, maybe you, CalFlora, could work with the consortium to get that uh, georeference data updated somehow because it's just such a valuable data set. If mm -hmm. it's, um, I agree, it's really valuable, and um, I'm not saying that you shouldn't use it. I actually think for an email alert, it is important to add it. Yeah. The thing that I was saying was that if you're going to be using Observer Pro to go back and revisit historical observations for a lot of the older stuff in CCH, the lat long just isn't precise enough. Like they they got a grant in 20 or 2009, I think it was maybe a million dollars or maybe more to georeference the old records. And, and basically the problem is that there's a location description like on top of Table Mountain. Well, there's eight Table Mountains in Cal California and <laughs> yeah. you can, some, you know, some, sometimes it's not that bad. Sometimes it's much more specific like Northwest Davis or North Davis. Um, but so I guess- Sometimes to, yeah. it's, it's also QAQCing their own like, uh, for example, when I cross-checked and, and worked on this in the Herbarium to find out what had happened, like, they hire students to input the data, and it's all mm -hmm. just inputted manually. And so mm -hmm. sometimes, you just on the coordinates, if, you know, the numbers are put in wrong, you know, you end up with something in the wrong place. And so yeah. I think there's a lot of that that goes on as well. Mm -hmm. But anyway, I don't want to yeah. take time Yeah, here. I think it's like something that could really be valuable if we could get it more accurate. You know? Well, CCH2 is you know, people are adding observations or specimens to CCH2 today, and they have really high location accuracy. So once CalFlora is serving CCH2 information, it probably would be worth putting into Observer Pro to go back and revisit those. And what I would do is do a date filter. So I would say, you know, do, for Observer Pro searches, I don't want anything that was seen before, I don't know, 2000 maybe. 
And that way it would throw out the really old stuff that you don't want to be looking for in Observer Pro. You know, you have your little blue dot on the map and then the dot where the specimen supposedly came from and it just, no, it won't work out. But anything after 2000, it is really useful. So, um, so yeah, so, but this is for the email alert and I just added CCH and iNaturalist to it. And if you don't want one or the other, you know, you can always take them out. I'm gonna make this email alert available to the group, but you can create your own email alerts and do whatever you want with them. So tools, save searches, I'm gonna, let's see, what should I call it? I'll say YOLO County Target Weeds. target weeds. All right, so save that, yes. And then set up an email alert. So I already have a bunch of alerts set up, don't be overwhelmed. And then, oh my goodness. And go to your available searches. I should really have a separate account for demonstrations so that it's not quite so overwhelming. Um, so are you gonna get alerts because you're setting this up or? Yeah, I will. Helpful? And and you guys can too, but we don't, we can't tell you to, um, you have to go into your Califlora account. And sign up and, for our own alerts. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And. And I'll make this search available to you if I can ever find it in here. Here it is. So I'm going to make this a weekly, add an alert, and then available searches. You know, I group is here, and I thought that I could make it um, available to the group. Huh. That's just that's the Davis list. We want the whole county. Oh yeah, thanks. Oh, right, right, because I already added it. So now if I refresh this page, my alerts, I should just do a find YOLO. So YOLO County Target Weeds is a weekly alert that I just set up and you can set that up too as a weekly alert. Um, and that way, whenever any of these species is found, um, run this search. So whenever this number goes up from 305, when it turns to 306, you'll get an alert. It also lets you know if somebody edits their observation or changes it in here. So for instance, if Lauren um, edits this in some way, adds a photo or does anything to it, that's also included in the alert. So it's modified or added to, observations modified or added to. Now, how does this inform what grows here? So if you go to tools and you go to what grows here at this location, which is just Yolo County, back it out a little. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, let's take this list off. No plant list. So what grows in Yolo County? Everything. Everything, <laughs> oh my goodness. I back it out a little bit more. So the area is in the map area. Search is a pretty big map area. Well, Cynthia, so what we're, um, what we're trying to do is, um, is get our weed list on, on the map. So mm -hmm. some of those weeds that are on our target list, we know mm -hmm. where they are and we're treating them. And some of them we don't, it's like old information from the ag department or potential weeds. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, if somebody's out doing their work and they bump into one of these weeds, we really would like it to be mapped. And what I have encouraged, so Michael who left the meeting already, um, he and I had a call about this a, a few weeks or a month ago. I think you should just encourage people to add observations to uh, however, like they could call you, they could email you with photos mm -hmm. attached, they could call a 1866 number, somebody the other week had that going on. They could add it to Cal Flora, they could add it to iNaturalist, they can, you know, whatever format they're comfortable with, have mm -hmm. them have them just include that information and then um, encourage them to let people know in any way that they that works for them. Yes, I've been encouraging that for a couple of years now. Okay, great. And now <laughs> you guys know 
how you can add your own stuff to Calflora. So add observations, plant observation entry we went through um, with Tanya's observation. We didn't do a survey. We showed you how to add records for my naturalist and multiple photo upload, you drag and drop and upload geotagged photos and then using the phone app. So that's how you can, you're saying you wanna make it more robust, the Correct. information that's available. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and if you can spread the word and um, get people to do that, that'll be really helpful. Um, this is a little bit of a sidetrack, but Gina asked about Whip It because if you wanted to prioritize Whip it is a prioritization tool. If you prioritize what it is you're going to be working on, depending on how much funds you have to spend. Um, as we were in plant observation entry, at the bottom of that, so let's see, my observation. Since Tanya's observation is still in my account, um, editor, edit, here's her polygon with the point in it. And then down here, gosh, where is it? Population. Oh yeah, here we go. So edit. Was it, um, how's access to the site, Tanya? Easy. Very easy. Very easy. Plant count? Well, let's just say the 251 to 1000, because that's what it was two springs ago. Oh, right. And we were going to add a, a stack to this. And priority? One. Top. Is one is one high, Gina? I guess it should say one high and five low here, just to be yeah, clear. I, I just don't know why. I don't know what that field is for because Whippet calculates that. So I don't know which uh, question that is referring to for priority. Okay. Um, yeah. All right. I'm gonna. Um, I'll figure that out and get back to you about that and what's going on. So I saved that, and now that is included in the record information for this observation and when you use whip it it uses pulls all that in the accessibility and the plant count and to help you prioritize and now if we wanted to save new record new assessment of so we're going to create a history stack when was the next time you saw it 20 you said last year I've been checking it every spring every spring so we'll say 2025 a one and how was the polygon? It was very small. Smaller. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this time I won't go crazy with the polygon. Stop trying. Save. And now you can see the history stack with the old 2018 observation where the mm. polygon was bigger and then the 2020 observation where it was smaller. And then this year when Tanya goes back, she can add another um, record on, onto that history stack to show change over time. And for this one that you saw last year, so that Whippet will work properly, let's just go ahead and fill in. Um, it's still very easy to access. What was the plant count? Two to 25. <laughs> okay. So save that. And then um, Gina, do you want to say anything about Whippet in terms of the WMA and your work with these weeds? I, don't I think know. we should maybe wait for an, another meeting on that one. On that we're one. just trying okay. to get people to do just this. Basic data entry. Got it. Yes. So any yes. questions about Calflora and basic data entry and these methods we've gone over? Well, I have a basic. So you did, how did you do the stack? You went to new record of same plant? Yeah, new record. Yeah, and same. they said new assessment. And okay, you can do new, that okay. on Observer Pro also if you're looking at historical records. Historical okay. just means anything not today. Right. You touch okay. it and it says new assessment. Okay. And then could you zoom out and, and do the county map again? Sure. So the work for that, just to see in the county for all your mm -hmm. target weeds. Yeah. So, well, my question page. was there's a bunch of different. The, there's different colored dots. And I'm wondering what those are. Oh, uh, yeah. That's a good question. <laughs> Criteria, plant list, the why thing is really such a That's good super thing. super handy, I know. It's so handy. <laughs> All right, lots of different colors. Yes, so what do those mean? Legend oh, is at the top go. of the map. Obscured, that's interesting. I wonder why some people would I did that, weeds. that's a private ranch. Oh, there you go, wow. Yep. Did you think you did all of these? Oh no, there's just that one up there. Oh no, there's a couple more. What's that Tanya? one? Tanya. Oh, that's somebody's house. <laughs> to swimming pool and you so you got the obscured thing good for you yeah uh, blue specimen 
So this okay, is from. Okay, so that's from specimen. I guess that's from CCH, although usually it says CCH here. Uh -huh. And this one is another one, another specimen. And then pink is polygon and okay. potential habitat. We have this new thing for invasives. It's not that useful, but we have this new thing where you can say, I don't see it here, but it's potential habitat. And that would be orange. <laughs> Again, whole county. <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay, any other questions? I'm motivated to use this tool and I apologize for not having done it yet, but I have a friend in winters who has pokeweed in his backyard and I am very motivated to, uh, to yeah. get that. And you could obscure it so that that we wouldn't just go show up and start spraying in his yard. I'll ask, I'll ask you about that. Which, of course, we should we should do that. I have, I have a question about the obscuring. I, I'm curious to know how much is obscured because often when I look at these maps, I think I know where the obscured point is. And you know, as a, working for a public agency, I mean, we're told not to. I, I know of a case not terribly many years ago where a, a California state agency uh, botanist reported a rare plant population on private property. And then a lawsuit came about and that person ended up retiring early. And, you know, it's just really sensitive sometimes. And um, I just, you know, I'm just a little uneasy about that, this part of it. it it's, but it's important to know where these things are. So um, I, well, I, just, I can, so this is obscured to everybody, but I know where the, when I log on, I can see where those are. So yeah, it doesn't help. It doesn't really obscure it. That's why I'm wondering how, yeah. um, how do we draw the line? Like, Well, it, it's yeah, this isn't exactly one. where it is. So if you look here in the record detail, go to location, or let's look at it here. Um, it's in the center of the quarter quad. Let's turn on quads region. Oh my oh, gosh. Grid quarter quad. All right, back it out. So every obscured, see how this says obscured here, Willie de Seth Thistle. Tanya found it somewhere in this quarter quad and it puts it in the center of the quarter quad if it's obscured. Mm -hmm. and, and that's not the exact location. Um, it's just somewhere in there. And every that's obscured. I didn't, I didn't understand that. That's very helpful. Yeah, okay. And a quarter quad is approximately a mile and a half by a mile right, and a half right. in California. Yeah. That's yeah, a big area. Any other questions? I have a question. Um, did you say that you can download this data? Like if I wanted to download everything I entered in here, how would I do that? Yeah, there's a couple different ways you can do it. If you just want to copy and paste, you can um, go to copy and paste. You can just copy it, you know, start here, hold down shift all the way down to the bottom and paste. You can change your column set so that you get the lat long. So from here, customize, like, I think everybody wants to have lat long in here. So latitude, add a column after, longitude, add a column after, apply. So now you could copy and paste again. You get the species name, the lat long, and all the information about it. Another way, probably better way, I would say, is to go to, from the homepage again, about Calflora, and then we have this observation download, and you can search for um, any, you can search for a specific species, and then here are all the download formats, Excel, CSV, tab mm -hmm. delimited, bar delimited, KML, JSON, Geo, shapefile, blah, 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 blah. You can draw a grid, you can do all of Yellow County. Um, you can include checklists, include iNaturalist records, georeference records only, natural status. Here you can search for planted things, that's interesting. And group association, if you wanted to download only the observations associated with your group, you could choose your group here and then download it. You can get an API, yeah. Does that answer your question? Absolutely. Thank you. Okay, sure. <laughs> I, oh my gosh, this is such a powerful tool. And I definitely feel like I'm at the tip of the iceberg on it. Yeah, you, uh, you know, you guys are doing great. And I'm impressed with the activity, your WMA and your, you know, that you guys have so far. And I think with this momentum, it'll 
you know, you'd be able to document a lot more. And if you do have questions um, for CalFlora, from the homepage down at the bottom, there's this contact CalFlora. So here's our email address. We write it in like this so we don't get a bunch of spam. And please include a URL with your questions. So if you have a question like, what, what do all these colors mean? Take this whole thing, paste it into email, and then say, what do all these colors mean? And we'll be able to help you better. I mean, now you know it's a legend, but in case you didn't know. OK, any other questions? Millions, but we should probably keep moving. <laughs> OK, thanks for having me. Talk to you Thank guys you, later. Cynthia. Okay. Are you going to stay around for the next? Um, yes. Good, be because. Good. OK, let's see. Got so sucked into that that I don't have my presentation up. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so you stop screen sharing and oh, okay, here I go. Okay, so you can see my little lead slide there. Okay, so now that we know how to map and um, I had, yeah, I just wanted to talk about our target weed lists and next steps because our funding is ending at the end of March. So we've been having meetings and I've been sort of bothering people, you know, pestering people to map. I did a little presentation right at the beginning of COVID, which was um, not as good as yours. And um, so here's our target list. This looks familiar. I actually added um, red sesbania because I did find one along the Sacramento River and there's a potential for more upstream. So this list should look familiar to you. Um, I just want to really quickly go over it. So um, Russian knapweed, we, uh, it is um, known and mapped and we're treating it. Barbed goat grass, of course, is all over the place. We're only going to treat it if it's in a high value site or a little patch like the one in Davis. Um, alligator weed, we've talked about that plant a lot in this group. The distaff thistle, it's known and mapped and we're working on it. Um, purple star thistle, there's a little bit of it. Um, in Poudre Creek, I know personally, I know some ranchers who are working on it and don't want our help. Um, the Iberian knapweed is apparently somewhere down in the bypass, but that has not been confirmed. Skeleton weed, I went to go look for and did not find it. Oblong spurge, there's a couple patches. Some are from 2010 are gone. There's a few new ones. Those are the ones that um, that uh, are also being worked on. Yellow flag iris, there is a patch or two that we're working on. White top, so that's one that it, it was on this list that um, originally from 2010. Um, it, it's, you know, we don't know if we have it or not. If we do, it might be mixed in with perennial pepperweed. Um, pokeberry is one that's definitely moving in. It likes riparian areas. Um, I haven't mapped any of it. Miles is going to map some. <laughs> the Sesbania I mentioned is along Sacramento River. Um, Silverleaf Nightshade, actually the Ag Department kind of like spraying the roadside patches. Um, I've pulled some. Tree of Heaven, again, that's a big one. We only want to work on it if it's in high value areas like along the creek. And then stinkwort, you know, when we put this on here in 2010 was a whole different ballgame than it is now. And so that's one that you just, you know, we're not going to ever eradicate that plant, but we can try to keep it out of our project areas. So um, here's a few pictures of our, of our target plants. And I think a lot of people know what they look like, but um, skeleton weed is actually I've never seen it, although I did try to go look. It looks very much, and I, I uh, encourage you guys all to Google and look at these plants if you haven't seen them before. Skeleton weed looks like, um, when it's young, it kind of looks like a dandelion. You know, the rosette is, is uh, 
dandelion ish. So it's kind of a rare one, but apparently it's a big problem in other places that we do not want it here. Like purple star thistle, Russian knapweed is another one that's a big problem in other places. Um, yeah, the Cisbania, I took that picture myself along the river. Spurge, then there's um, a few patches of yellow flag iris along Cache Creek. And then there's a distaff thistle, still don't know where it is, but I took that picture. <laughs> so these are the guys, um, the mysterious plants that uh, we have not mapped. Well, I won't say pokeberry is mysterious, but um, it hasn't been mapped. Purple loosestrife, I mapped a giant patch of it in the settling basin and like that's not early detection, rapid response. It's, we lost it out there already. White top, I encourage you to Google this one and look at pictures. It really does look a lot like pepperweed. And then here's the Iberian thistle, which looks a lot like purple star thistle. I'm going through this a lot faster than I thought. So um, we got two grants from CDFA in 2019. Um, and one of them was to reactivate the weed management area, which we have done. We've had a lot of successful meetings. We had a great in-person meeting and then COVID hit. So we, this is our third Zoom meeting, but we had about 30 people at each meeting. Um, and the idea was in our grant proposal was mo more eyes on the ground than just us and trying to get people to do more mapping. Um, and again, we're focusing on these regionally rare weeds, outlier populations. It's all about early detection, rapid response. So, yeah, go ahead. So what about the, the big uh, initiative you have for Arundo? Do you want, you still want oh, to That's a completely that different project. That one's, okay. that's but it's a, really not then, uh, okay. I think what we're thinking is like maybe 10, years down the road when the Rondo project's wrapping up, we may get some WMA money to keep things cleaned up, but that one, that's a whole different okay. um, animal. So this slide I actually um, took from my first presentation back in September, 2019, um, to try to, to uh, encourage folks to um, get some information about these weeds. Um, so map all additional species and newly discovered locations of those EDRR plants, um, obtain permission from landowners. I know some two big ranchers and they said, you know, we're, we're, we're taking care of our purple star thistle. Um, so they didn't require any technical assistance. Um, document things in Calflora. If nothing else, if you don't ever pull it or do anything, just please map it so we know that it's there. Um, and then if we, there's a data sets from anybody. I know that um, folks that UC Reserve are gonna give us some information. So that's the objective of that grant. And it's, um, I will admit that I have not given it as much attention as it deserves. Um, but there's a little action photo. The whole reason we're doing this is to get these stupid things under control. So next steps for our weed management area, um, we are going to continue having meetings um, from some of our general funds from the Resource Conservation District after March 31st when things wrap up. Um, CDFA releases money to Ag Commissioners for weed work. Um, last time they released it, it was in the transition. John was retiring in a week or two and he didn't want to give the new Ag Commissioner a grant he may not want to deal with. But I think with Umberto, we'll be able, you know, next time those Ag Commissioners are given an RFP, we'll be able to um, do the work and have the Ag Commissioner be a pass through. So we'll be able to do some on the ground stuff. So we've been having weed management areas meetings twice a year. So we will have another meeting and I think that'll be in August. So does anyone have any questions for me? I kind of threw a lot of that out. This shouldn't be new information for people who were at the first meeting. Um, and I've been doing a lot of mapping. Amy's doing some mapping. Um, so we are, we will have a map for CDFA when we're done, but um, and we have done a lot of on the groundwork. And we also have the second grant to do EDR, EDRR work on county park properties. So we've been doing that. 
So that is, um, that's my update. You guys have any questions? Thanks, Tanya. Could you give us an update of the status of the Arundo work that was done over the course of the summer? Ah, uh, yes. Um, Bethany, are you still here? Because I'm- Yes, um, I'm still here. Bethany is the project manager. She swooped in. She's only been working, gosh, we hired her in March and, you know, during COVID. <laughs> and she just picked up this really tough project and is doing a great job. So she should get to tell, tell you about that if you would like to, Bethany, or do you want me to? Yeah, I can give a little overview. Um, so we started with a rondo treatment earlier in November, and we have multiple different agencies working on helping us out with this. So we have the Yolo County Flood Control District. Uh, we have some crews hired by Cache Creek, and we have a contracted crew from down in Riverside, closer to San Diego, that is helping with a lot of treatment also. And so we've been able to do initial treatment on almost all of the sloughs in Yolo County. We've also started work on Cache Creek and in the Settling Basin area as well as down in Solano County on Pleasance and Puda Creek. So we've treated almost 25 acres this year and we're gonna be working on coming up in August, starting all over again and trying to treat another 25 acres as well as doing retreatment on as much as we possibly can from last year. Um, that's an, a high level overview. Did you have more detailed questions? <laughs> <laughs> that is a high level overview. <laughs> Fantastic. Was there any mechanical removal as part of the 25 acres? Yes. Yeah, we did do chipping and mulching or yeah, chipping about, um, I think that was on about seven acres of it, I believe. I'd have to double check my notes, but we did it on anything that was over a quarter an acre in size. We chipped that and left it along the road. If you're ever driving down road 95 in Yolo County, there's some nice chipped sections right along there where you can see it used to be a rondo and now it's a nice empty patch with mulch on the ground it's very satisfying Beautiful. it's brutal work <laughs> it's brutal work 27 I'm, yeah on 27th and 95 mm -hmm. yeah just north of 27 yeah it looks great you can actually see the comparison there there's one section of some really thick arundo that we sprayed and left and then across the road, we did a bunch of chipping. So you can see how big those patches were. Excellent. Thank you guys so much for your great work. Yeah, we're excited. <laughs> it's a huge job. So we're also looking to expand up into the Cape Bay Valley and that's where we need more landowner agreements. It's a very slow process. Makes sense. How about the water permits? You've mentioned that, Tanya. What's the, you're targeting outlier populations higher up in the- oh. Creek and Cash Creek watersheds? Or you know, I probably shouldn't have put that picture in there. Um, there's not much of it in the upper watershed. And every time I see it, I'm like, hmm, I need to get Brenda on this because it's there is a native one and apparently there, there, there's four species or three and they're really hard to tell apart from each other. Most of the ones here though in Yolk County are the invasives. Okay, Even, yeah. But, yeah. There's been a patch up on Cash Creek up in the Rumsey area for a long time, many years. Oh. We can look at that when we do our safari. I was going to say, is it mapped? Because I didn't know that. Probably not. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, there's herbarium specimens that have been okay. so It's probably uh, on record. 